And hello and welcome everybody to great Wednesday afternoon Pacific time. It is 4 p.m. And for me, what that means is it's time to talk about some CCNA content that's going to be important to virtually everybody who hears it who's studying for their CCNA. If you're just joining us, my name is Keith Barker. It's great to have you. I am CCA 6783. I got my first one in 2001, another one in 2003, and I continue to learn new things about Cisco and new technologies all the time. So we're grateful you're here. The way these live streams work is we're going to focus on the topic as promised in the advertisement for this live stream, and then we'll take a quick pause and then do Q&A. Think of it like the instructor's hours afterwards. I got that question uh, on the in my social when the chat said, how is this different than CBT Nuggets? At CBT Nuggets, where I have a full-time career, we create the content for like CCNA. We have 50 plus hours of content. They're focused, they're lab-based, there's hands-on labs, they're in and out, nobody gets hurt, focusing on the topics. This is more like the instructor after hours to talk about a topic, ch chat about it, share with insights about it, and then take your questions. So uh, for anybody who's interested at CBT Nuggets, if you haven't checked us out, there's a free seven-day trial. I strongly recommend you check it out, see what the hubbub is all about. So it's Jeremy Chara, Chuck Keith, and myself created the CCNA content there. Now, for our topic today is wireless. I've been watching lots and lots of videos about people's experience with the CCNA exam. Now, it's as of this recording, it's the 11th of March, 2020. I have not sat the exam yet. Uh, I'm planning on taking it probably within the next six weeks and I'll make I'll do a live stream about that as well. But I've been paying close attention to what people are saying as they've taken the exam and their experiences. And one of the things that I've noticed based on my feedback that I've heard is that the, there was some wireless content there that was pretty challenging for individuals. And so what I'd like to do is take just a few minutes in this live stream and talk about wireless in an infrastructure with a wireless LAN controller access points, explain how the relationship is between those guys and why we would use them, talk a little bit about security, and then give you a way to get hands-on practice with all those elements for free. And it's pretty easy to do. I've promoted and talked about Packet Tracer forever. Well, not forever, but since we've been doing these live streams, I've been encouraging people to get their hands-on practice. I thought, you know what? Is it time? Is it time today <laughs> to break out Packet Tracer? And the answer is yes, because a lot of people don't have access points and wireless LAN controllers just laying around that they can just lab up and get hands-on practice with. And so I'm going to share with you a zero, starting with a green field, nothing there, um, topology with Packet Tracer and build it up to where we have servers, clients, access points, controllers, and a wireless client. That's what we're going to do. So let's set up, let's go ahead and do a plan to cover all of that. And as I'm also, by the way, I saw a lot of the people that were in the uh, in the room. It is so great to see so many familiar faces and also a lot of new faces as well. So our focus here is training, 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 and getting people better at the various technologies. So let's, let me create another level right here. There you go. All right, got my camera dialed in and let's just do from the ground up, we'll call it zero to wireless local area network. We won't call it a hero. I just want to share with you the ability to get this up and running in a very short period of time. And having a plan is a big part of that. So here, let's draw out our plan. For a plan, we probably had to have something at the middle of our network to glue it all together. Now, if you think, what is it in a corporate network or even in a home network that glues many devi devices physically together? And one of the things that might come up for us is a switch. Just a simple layer two switch. It learns source addresses, makes layer two forwarding decisions. It's a wonderful thing. But we're going to use that as the glue for our little enterprise that we're going to build from the ground up. Then we're also going to need somewhere in the enterprise something to hand out IP addresses. And for that, let's use a server. And that will be a DH. Actually, you know what? It's going to be more than, it's going to be more than just DHCP. So we'll call this SRVR. And it can do DHCP, which we're going to need several times, as we'll see here coming up. And let's also make it a web server so that we can test if we're doing TCP testing to connect to various devices. And let's see, what else will we need? We're also going to need something called a wireless LAN controller. Let's talk about that for a moment, and then we'll, I'll draw one in, and then we'll, we'll talk about it. So this little device, where should we put it? Let's put it, um, let's put it over here. We'll call it WLC for wireless LAN 
controller. And let's talk about Wi-Fi for a moment. In order for, I mean, we use Wi-Fi all the time. Think about it. We're on the Wi-Fi networks, like almost ubiquitously. We're out of just, you go to a restaurant, there's Wi-Fi. You're at home, there's Wi-Fi. There, at work, there's Wi-Fi. And so we associate with an access point. An access point, let me go ahead and draw one in while we talk about it here. An access point is a device that sends and receives radio frequencies. Uh, think of it like the Wi-Fi signals. So if we have a user, let me go ahead and draw a user out here. So we'll call this Bob. I don't know why Bob is purple, but today he is. So Bob is a wireless device. He associates with an access point to get access to the network wirelessly. But in an environment where we have lots of devices, lots, maybe even several floors or several buildings, we need to coordinate the access points so we have even coverage of the entire space that we need to cover. And manually configuring each one of those access points, like, okay, oh, you're going to be in the 2.4 gigahertz range, centered on channel 1 or channel 6 or channel 11. We'll have other uh, videos that talk more about the wireless frequencies and the 2.4 gigahertz space and the 5 gigahertz space and also some security. But at the end of the day, we need to have the APs placed in such a way that we can make sure that there's coverage for anybody in the... Oh, that's purple. <laughs> that's... <laughs> I was trying to make it the same color as the other guy. Hold on one second. And let me, uh, I need a color like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to use my pen tool. I'm going to grab that color and then I'm going to go ahead and repeat it over here. Why is that purple? Hold on one moment. <laughs> Why are you purple? Okay, uh, if we can fix this in about two, two nanoseconds. Oh, it's because I have my other tool out. Hold on a second. If I can't fix this in a few nanoseconds, it's going to be a purple AP, just for a little diversity. Yep, it's going to be a purple AP. That's how it's going to roll. All right, and we close that window too. All right, in the heat of battle. So here's another access point over here, and we want to make sure that we have enough connectivity and overlapping frequency, overlapping signal range, so that we can actually cover the whole network and all anywhere where Bob might want to roam. And so those are all connected. I'm going to go ahead and bring another layer in. Maybe that'll help me. So this is all connected to the network physically. So the access points are going to be wired into the network. And then as Bob associates with one, an access point or if he's roaming, associating with more than one access point, that's what gives him that Wi-Fi connectivity for access into the network. So that's Wi-Fi with a little dash in there. So the benefit of having a controller is that if we have 10 or 20 or 30 access points, we want to be able to centrally manage them and not have to go to each and every one like, okay, here's your configuration, here's your configuration. So what we do is we talk to the controller and we tell the controller the instructions, what we want to have happen, and then we have the access points report into the controller. Think of it like uh, a manager and their staff. And so the access points are going to be the staff. The wireless LAN controller is the manager who's in charge of everything. And so if Bob connects to this access point, this access point actually forwards that, tunnels that traffic over to the controller where it makes the decisions on can Bob get in, how should Bob be routed, and so forth. And we have one wireless LAN controller or a set of them that are in charge of the entire enterprise. So that's sort of the architecture. I was looking at the blueprint for CCNA. Let me grab it real quick. And here's what it said. It said, describe the physical infrastructure connections of wireless local area networks, including an access point, so they're going to be hardwired to a switch. A wireless LAN controller, which is also going to be wired to a switch. And then it talked about some other layer two connectivity surrounding it as well. And then it also mentioned about the architecture of how these guys interact with each other. So now we have a server that can be a DHCP server or a web server, a wireless LAN controller that can be in charge of these access points. And we can just make the commands here and the wireless LAN controller can talk to those access points and configure them. And then we'd also probably want a management workstation as well. Hold on one second. I'm curious why I just can't get another freaking color out of my uh, color wheel here. Hold on one second. I'm going to get one more shot. Yeah, it's like stuck. And I don't know why. Hmm. I'm, I'm anxious to... Uh, Okay, there we go. All right, a little persistence there. So we also need a management station so we could work on this. So let's say this is our computer, MGMT, that's also connected to the switch. 
So here's the game plan for setting up this environment and so that we can manage the wireless LAN controller and the controller can manage the access points. We need to have some IP addressing in place. So let's plan on that collectively. And let's put IP addressing in white. Let's use the 10 network. And we can use an 8-bit mask. That'll just save me a few, typing, uh, few keystrokes. <laughs> I won't have to type 255 as many times. And for the DHCP server, let's use dot .10. For the wireless LAN controller, let's use dot .11. For this management client, if we bring up the DHCP server first, it can get an IP address dynamically. These access points can get an IP address dynamically. And Bob, once he associates with the wireless network, he can also get uh, an IP address dynamically from the DHCP server. So all we really need is those two addresses. So that's the concept. I'd like to go ahead and demo and also have it walk you through so you can watch this video later if you want and just get Packet Tracer for free. Just go to netacad.com, sign up for a free account and then just use Packet Tracer. And you can follow step by step with what I'm about to do. And I'm just gonna do it from the ground up, starting with a zero, no topology there whatsoever, no, no pre-placed devices. And that way you can get a good head start with Packet Tracer as well. All right, so I'm just taking, I might have to come back to this and look at it to get a refresher on the actual uh, IP addresses. Actually, there's only two IP addresses, dot .10 and dot .11. And then as we place each of the devices, we'll talk about it as we go through. And our goal is for me to share with you how we can get this up and running and active in just a, few, a matter of minutes. And that way it can give you the framework to start practicing with wireless LAN controllers and managing and knowing where in the interface certain things are. It's a fantastic opportunity for that. So let me bring up Packet Tracer and let me dial this in just a little bit so it nice, fits nice and evenly. Okay, so there's, op there's preferences that you can set. If you go to options and preferences, pre you can, make things show up or not show up. There's lots of tuning that can be done, but this is basically a flat, wide open, nothing here yet network. And if we go to help and about, this is version 7.3 and change that I'm using. So you need, so I just wanna share with you what that version is and probably a future version you could do it as well. So let's start off and let's build our topology. Here's how we do it. I'm clicking on the logical tab up here on the top left and I'm simply gonna put a switch in. So down here on the left, we click on, we have routers, switches, hubs, wireless devices. We're gonna click on the switch icon right here. And then I'm just gonna drag up a 2960. Nothing fancy. My hands are never gonna leave my arms. Just nothing too fancy. Basic switch, all the ports are gonna be up by default. Uh, it has a built-in power supply, so we don't have to add one. That's handy. It's got all its ports are in VLAN 1, one flat, VLAN, one flat network. And let's, start, let's add our server. So we'll click on this icon right here for end devices down the left-hand corner. And then it's gonna drag up a server. And that'll be our DHCP and DNS and web and other options that we can specify as well. So there's our server. And you can rename these two if you'd like. I'm just gonna leave the default names. And while we're here, let's bring up our management computer, our PC. And let's also, let's see a server, laptop, great. So down on the left, We'll go ahead and click on network devices right here. Make sure it's in, in vision, yep. And then we'll click on this little icon for wireless. That's wireless devices. And let's bring up some wireless devices. For this demo, I'm just gonna bring up a generic uh, lightweight access point, and that's worth talking about. Actually, let's just bring in two of them. An autonomous access point is one that works by itself. I can do everything myself. I don't need to be a part of a team. I'll just be configured locally. Somebody can connect to me with a console port. They can connect to me with uh, T, you know, TF by, via SSH or Telnet. Nobody uses Telnet anymore. To go ahead and be configured. That's called an autonomous. It's all by itself. When we're using access points, these radio generators and receivers, when we're using them in combination with a controller, it's referred to as a lightweight access point. And that's because the access point by itself isn't doing all the heavy lifting. It's part of a team. It's responsible for the radio signals, but it's getting all the training and instructions and all the heavy decision-making processes are gonna be done by the controller, which we should bring up next. So there's three options for, well, there's several options for controllers here. Let's go ahead and grab the 3504 and bring it up. This will be the brains for our wireless network. And before we cable all these together, let's, let's do a couple configuration items on the server. Let's see, oh, we also need a smart client. Let's go ahead and go back to end devices over here near the bottom left, and let's bring up a smart device. How smart are you? 
we'll see once we get it all configured. The other cool thing is you can hover over these guys and they'll give you details about that device so you don't have to actually have to go to the command line, although you can go down to the command line or to the configs of each, of each one of them. So on the server, let's give it an IP address. We'll just click on it. That's how easy it is. Let's click on it to bring it up, checking my feedback monitor to make sure we can see it. That shows us the physical view. That's the tab that we're on right there. And let's, uh, let's go to config and let's go to fast ethernet zero and let's give it a static IP address. Based on our plan, this is our server. It's gonna be 10.0.0.10. I got excited with my periods there and tab and we'll use the default class A mask of 255.0.0.0. That's great. And also while we're here, we'll just go to services, the services tab and say we want DHCP and we can start the pool. It has a default pool here called server pool. We can start handing out IP addresses at, let's start at 101 and it's gonna hand out that many or could hand out that many. And also let's do this. Here's the WLC address. When a, when a wireless access point boots up, if it's in lightweight access mode, lightweight autonomous, lightweight AP mode, when it gets an IP address via DHCP, if it gets the option for the wireless LAN controller address, which is an option in DHCP, it then knows, okay, I have my IP address, I'm gonna check in with the wireless LAN controller to go ahead and get my instructions and follow his instructions or her instructions based on how I should be, what wireless networks are there, what protocols are used and so forth. And so handing it out from the DHCP server makes a lot of sense. So that's gonna be 10.0.0.11. We, actually, we, we haven't set up that wireless landing controller yet, but we also haven't put any connectivity in our network with cables yet. That's all coming. So let me see if I have everything here. That looks great. And it's just a flat network, so I don't need a default gateway, at least handing out one, and because there's nowhere else to go except for this 10 network. And then we'll simply click on Save. That updated our details here. And so we have DHCP running and just to check on HTTP, we have web services running by default, that's great. And we could also make this a radius server if we wanted to with AAA. We could set, we could set up who had, if we wanted AAA clients using radius to the server, we could. Uh, that would be a bit beyond what we need to do for this demonstration. All right, so that's our server, all set up, good to go. And let's set up the controller. Now, the controller, I ran through this last night and I, for the, for the, 3504 wireless LAN controller. I just went to Cisco's docs, looked at it, and it has a console port on it. So you can connect to it via console port or some basic commands to bootstrap it, give it an IP address. It also has a default address. If we hover over this, it's got a default address, a management IP address of 192.168.1.1 with the slash 28. But if we want to here in packet trace, we can just click on it, go to config, go to management, and we can simply specify the address we want it to use as a starting point which is what I want to do. So we'll give this guy 10.0.0.11. Why? Because that's the IP address the DHCP server is going to hand out saying that there's your wireless LAN controller. And then we'll use the same mask we're using everywhere else. And I think that's it. I always like, in Packet Tracer, I always like to click off and then click back just to make sure the value there is what I think it is. Also, there's no apply in Packet Tracer many times. It's like you put it in and it's done. So that takes a little getting used to because there's no, not like a commit or an OK button. You just put it in, you verify it's there, and then you close it. So we've got the wireless LAN controller at 10, 10, 0, 11. I'm sorry, 10, 0, 0, 11. The server at 10, 10, 0, 10 acting as a DHCP server. Let's wire it up. So to wire it up in Packet Tracer, you simply click on this lightning bolt icon in the bottom left-hand corner. And then there's the option for auto connect. That's the lightning bolt again. And if you're not sure, do I need a crossover cable or a straight through cable, that lightning bolt, lightning bolt option, it just gives you, it automatically connects for you. So this is connecting to our, from our wireless LAN controller to the switch. It's showing a dotted cable, which represents a crossover cable because there's switch ports on both those devices. And we'll do it again. And we'll go from the server to the switch. That's a straight through cable, hence the black line there. And then we'll do it again. Actually, that's, yeah, we need to wire in the access. I'm going to wire in the access points after we have the wireless LAN controller all set up. In fact, uh, until we get the, yeah, I need to wire the client in because we're going to manage the wireless LAN controller from the client. All right. So that yellow, that, or that orange, amber color that you see right there, that's spanning tree. One thing that's pretty darn interesting about Packet Tracer is that 
They're going to make you wait for a spanning tree to go from its listening to learning to forwarding state unless you turn on rapid spanning tree, which doesn't have listening, just learning and forwarding, or if you enable port fast. And we have videos of all those in the playlist here at CBT, at, at CBT Nuggets. <laughs> we definitely have that content at CBT Nuggets, but I also have some videos that here on YouTube in that playlist. All right, it's gone green. So this laptop should be able to get an IP address. If we hover over it, uh, let's go tell it. So we'll, I'm clicking on that PC. We'll go to config, fast ethernet zero, and we'll tell it to be a DHCP client just by clicking that button. There we go. Oh, 169, not good. So right there, I don't know if you can see that. It's showing a 169, which means you're a DHCP client, but something did not go well. Something didn't happen correctly. And that means our DHCP server probably isn't functioning. So this is a good test before we bring the APs online. I'm trying one more time. Yeah, so 169 is the APIPA, the Automatic Private IP Addressing Assignment, where the client says, I need to get via D I need to be a DHCP client, discover. And then something doesn't happen. The discover process, the Dora process doesn't happen. And then the client says, well, I guess I'll take a 169 address that I just pulled out of my uh, ear and use that. But it's not good. This is a problem. This is a troubleshooting problem. So let's go back to the server and click on services, DHCP. And right there, huh, look at that. Always works better when you enable the service. Great. So that's why we test as we go. All right. So now that it's enabled, let's go back to our client and we'll bounce him from static back to DHCP. And I'm hoping for a 10 dot zero zero dot something higher than a hundred address. And that's how the and that's how the live stream went. So I'm just gonna move the, so I've got connectivity. So it's not the switch and spanning tree holding me up. Let me try Oh, I was looking at the wrong okay. I'm in the wrong place. And interface faster than zero. There it is. Ten zero zero one oh two is the IP address that it has. I was simply on the wrong field. Okay, so to test this, let's do this. Let's go to the desktop on this client, this laptop, and bring up a command prompt. And let's do an IP config. They borrowed a few Windows commands for this little virtual machine. And let's do a ping to 10.0.0.10. .0 .0 That's the IP address of the server. Yeah, great, okay. Step by step, we're gonna make progress here and that's how we do it in a production environment too. You configure something, verify it, move forward. All right, so our PC is good. Let's go to our controller by clicking on it. And we've already specified the management interface here. Great. So now that's in place, here's how we can bootstrap the wireless LAN controller from our PC. We simply go to our PC and we bring up a browser, Chrome, Firefox, Mozilla, Edge, you name it, whatever you want to bring up. So you bring up a browser in the emulator here, there's a little button for it and you go to HTTP, and it's 10.0.0.11, the IP address of the controller. This is a new controller that has not been configured with an administrator password or anything else yet. And then we'll simply click on go. And with any luck, it's gonna, <laughs> it's gonna bring up this page right here as I smile, um, which gives us the chance to bootstrap this wireless LAN controller. And so it wants us to create a user account, an admin account. I'm going to use ADMIN. I'm going to use a password with upper and lower case, alphanumeric, at least eight characters. It has some minimum requ requirements. If you don't put them in the minimums, it'll tell you and say, ah, this is not good. So I'm going to use uppercase C, lowercase ISCO, exclamation mark two, three. And I'll repeat that. Now you might say, Keith, why did you tell everybody? Well, in case I forget halfway through the demo, you can remind me. Hey, Keith, this is the password. All right, so that's the admin password. We'll click on start. And let me give us a little more real estate here. And it's asking for a name for this new system. Also, see up here that where it says 2500 series? Guess what's gonna be very similar when you configure the wireless LAN controllers? They're all gonna be very similar. So it looks, it looks like to me in Packet Tracer, either they forgot to update that one field on top or or in the live, I can't imagine the live production environment that they left that banner. But I noticed that when I did it last night, I thought, eh, it's like, it's looking like an older wireless line controller. Okay, I'm gonna name this our WLC. 
And then it's going to scroll down. It's asking for the management IP address, which we're going to leave at 10.0.0.11 with a one octet on mask. And I'm going to give it a default gateway because last night it barked at me because I didn't. <laughs> so I'm going to give it what it wants. Click on next. Now it's asking, hey, let's create your first wireless network. So it's going to create a profile and a wireless SSID of the same name. So let's call this Wi-Fi dash one. And that way, if we create another Wi-Fi network, we can call it Wi-Fi two and associate that with a different profile and so forth. Then for security, it gives us a couple options here. WPA2 personal and WPA2 enterprise. Let's talk about that for a moment. In the old days, when wireless first came out, they had uh, WEP, which stood for Wired Equivalent Privacy, I believe. And it was broken very easily, cracked very easily. Then they came out with WPA, Wi-Fi Protected Access, which was better, but also cracked shortly thereafter. And then they came out with WPA2 and now also there's WPA3. So you want to use the best security that is supported by the clients and by the infrastructure. So your controller and the access points and everything you need to support whatever flavor you're using. And the WPA2 personal means that we're using pre-shared keys where we put in a password like ABC123, ABC or something. And that's the password that's being used when a client wants to authenticate or associate with the network. They have to have that same password, that pre-shared key. If we choose WPA2 Enterprise, what that means is that we're using some type of a AAA server. A AAA server is a fancy, not like Automobile Association of America. A AAA server is a server that sits there and says, I know a lot. Oh yeah, what do you know, AAA server? And this AAA server, also sometimes called an authentication server or a radius server or authentication or a TACX server, sometimes if you're using that protocol, it says, I know what usernames and passwords are directly, or I'm tied to Active Directory, I can pull it from there. And I also know who I'm willing to talk to and give that information. So we could configure a wireless LAN controller to do authentication with a radius server. So when the client authenticates, they'd put in their credentials, the wireless LAN controller would take those credentials, pass them over to a AAA server, who would say thumbs up or thumbs down, and then pass back the news, the good news or the bad news, so the client could authenticate. So WPA2 or better is what we should be using. And in this lab, for brevity, we're going to use WPA2 personal with a pre-shared key. That way, we don't have to set up the radius server in addition. But you know what? I did that yesterday also just for practice. Works like a champ. So those options are all yours inside a packet tracer when you're setting up a wireless environment. So if we chose WPA2 per, uh, enterprise, it's going to ask for the AAA server. If we choose WPA, WPA2 personal, it's just asking for the passphrase. So let's use, I'm going to use the same path. It would be a bad idea in production to use the same password to log into the controller as the same password <laughs> that you're going to have when people authenticate via the wireless network. But I'm going to do it so I only have one password floating in my brain. And that is uppercase Cisco. I'm just going to type it out. It's hard to chew gum and walk for some for, uh, sometimes for me. All right, and it looks like it took it. And I'm going to click on Next. It uses this virtual IP address of 192.0.2.1 for internal communications with its access points. We don't need to change that unless you had a reason to, so I'm gonna leave that as the default. And now it's giving us a summary. Okay, here's what you got going on. Username, name of the wireless LAN controller, the IP address, default gateway, the name of your first Wi-Fi network, the type of security you're using, and the management virtual IP address. We'll click on apply. It says, okay, I've got a reboot and we can go ahead and close this browser because when we connect back to this wireless LAN controller, we need to do it on HTTPS, which is using security and the services of SSL slash TLS to protect all the traffic between the management station, the PC we're sitting at, and the actual wireless LAN controller. So I'm going to click on this little X here, which closes that browser on this laptop that we're sitting at. And I'm not going to try to log in yet via HTTPS. And I'll tell you why. The people who created Packet Tracer, which is Cisco, they built in, it's a simulation, but they built in a lot of the delays, like spanning tree is gonna make you wait. When you're booting up a server for the first time or booting up a new service, it's rebooting, they're gonna make you wait a little bit. And that's good because it gives you a kind of a feel for the real world, like why, this isn't working now, it should be working now. Uh, things take a few moments to boot and initialize. And now that I've given it a few moments, I'm gonna click on 
HTTP from my laptop. And let me scroll this over so we can see it. And go back to the laptop. So this desk, this browser window represents coming off of this laptop right here. And we'll go to HTTPS, whack, whack, 10.0.11. Before I click on go, last night, uh, I couldn't get this working. I was like, I can't get there. I had transposed the IP address. I, would, I had the wrong IP address. So when planning out your topology, you might want to jot down the IP addresses you plan on using and stick with them. That way you remember where stuff is. So I'll click on go. It logs us into the wireless LAN controller. Click on login. I'll put in the username that we set up, which was admin. I'll type in that top secret password of capital C I S C O exclamation mark two three. And it's also got me last night too, is that if you just press enter, it's not going for this login button. So for this login, after you put your password in, <laughs> please click login. That's 10 minutes of my life I'll never get back. I mean, I tore it down, I rebuilt it. I was like, what? oh, I just gotta click on login as opposed to pressing enter. So there's our physical inter, there's a, this, this looks very much <laughs> like a live wireless LAN controller interface. It's amazeballs. So if you're curious, like where would you go in the wireless LAN controller to configure the, w, the authentication type? Or where would you go in the controller to do X, Y, Z? A few minutes in this will give you that practice of where it is. So if we clicked on, like if we scroll down a little bit, how come this guy has no access points? Look at that, total access points, zero, none, none. <laughs> and it's just occurring to me that, yeah, we haven't connected these access points to the network. So we should probably do that before we continue because it's gonna be pretty boring with a controller with no access points to control. So to connect these two in, we'll go ahead and I'm clicking on the connector, connector tool and then the lightning bolt again to use an automatic cable selector. It's a straight through cable based on the output here. Do it again. And then this is another, uh, I love this. I, I absolutely love this feature. You see how the, the link indicators are here? You can turn those off if you want. You can go to edit and preferences and turn our options preferences and turn them on or off so you don't see them. But it's handy because on the left hand side, this is showing, it should be showing spanning tree with the amber LED saying spanning tree hasn't gone to forwarding state yet. So this is the, that switch is the root switch. There's nobody else to compete. So all of its ports should be designated and forwarding. But this, this guy's never gonna recover or go over because see that red right there? That red next to the access points means we are down. Like on a router by default, the interfaces are down by default. And on an access point, they shouldn't be down by default. But you know what every access point loves? It loves either power over ethernet, <laughs> which is a great solution to deliver the power over the same mechanism you're delivering the signals with from the switch, or it loves a little transformer plugged in. So check this out. If we click on, the on this access point, here it's showing us the physical view. I'll zoom in a little bit. And on this physical view, see that little DC, that little power connector there? See how it's empty? Painful. So to solve that, you're gonna take this power supply and drag and drop the connector and plug it in. Boom, and you'll notice that little indicator went to green <laughs> because this access point is now on. Now in the background, what's happening, uh, spanning tree says, hey, there's somebody there. So the switch is gonna take its merry little time going through listening and learning with traditional spanning tree or learning and forwarding with rapid spanning tree. But either way, there's a delay there because port fast isn't enabled. You could always also do that if you wanted. But anyway, um, that port eventually will go to green on the switch at which time the client, this access point will do DHCP, Dora, discover offer request acknowledgement. The access point will get an IP address and a bunch of options. One of those options will say, hey, here's the wireless LAN controller address at which time the switch, the access point says, hey, okay, great. I'm gonna go ahead and report into the access to the wireless LAN controller and uh, link up with him and receive his instructions for a CAPWAP tunnel. CAPWAP is the, the language of love between an access point and the controller. So most of that should have already happened. We can also just hover over this and see. See how we're hovering over that? It says CAPWAP, let me get my other pen out. And that guy. So right here it says, oh, I just went away, darn. Um, let me hover again and get rid of my pen. 
We'll have to just watch it in hover mode. Oh, it's connected now. So right here, oh, I see what I did. I moved the mouse. So it says CapWAP status connected, meaning it's connected over to 10.0.0.11, the controller. And also look at that. How did, how did this access point know about supporting the Wi-Fi network called Wi-Fi 1? And the answer is it's getting its instructions from the controller. So let's bring in another one as well. That's this guy, the second access point. Drag up the power supply. We can do this one a lot faster because we know what's going on now. And then if we hover over it, it's saying it doesn't have an IP address yet. It's not associated with a uh, controller yet, but that'll all change. Just like a live environment, spanning trees got to give up, you know, let traffic flow on the switch port. Then the client, the access point will get an IP address via DHCP. Then it'll report to the controller. Then they'll take about 10 to 15 seconds to figure that out. And then eventually we're going to have an access point that's in cahoots with the controller. And now the controller is controlling both of those access points. So we can go to the controller and look at the details, create new VLANs or new Wi Fi networks, I should say. And all that information dynamically gets pushed out to these access points. So I'm just going to give one more moment for the second access point to get an IP address and also to associate with the controller. Do, 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 do. It's on its way. All right. I'm, I'm almost tempted. Oh, there we go. So it has an IP address. And now the next step would have an association with the controller via CapWAP. It's a fun game. The waiting game. There we go. All right. So it's all set. So if we go back to the controller, and the way we're managing this controller is from this management laptop. We've got a browser session with HTTPS over to the controller for management. If we go back here, in the access points, it says zero, but we need to do a refresh because that's the screen I left it on. So we'll click up here on the up. Oh, let me see if it's, er, my face is in the way. Sorry, let me move it over. So we'll click here on refresh. That should refresh the screen. Wait for it, wait for it. If not, we'll just log back in and uh, <laughs> I don't see him. I don't see him. I'm willing to log out and log back in because that'll force it to be shown up. Usually a refresh will do that for you if they're really associated. Click on login. Oh, there we go. All right, that refresh button in the upper right, by the way, in a production wireless LAN controller will refresh this page and it should show that the two access points are there. So if you scroll down a little bit, it sh <laughs> this cracks me up. Internal temperature, 31 degrees Celsius. <laughs> sure it is. <laughs> You're a simulation. Anyway, so here's the access points. We have two that are up currently. And as far as rogue APs, we have no rogue APs that are showing up. And if we click on the wireless LANs tab, it shows us our one wireless local area network called Wi-Fi 1. If we wanted to create a new one, we could go ahead and simply click go next to create new, create a new one. In fact, well, let's let's get one working and then we'll come back and tweak. Um, for this one vi wireless LAN, if we click on it, we can go ahead here and under the general tab, we can specify details. Is it enabled or not? For under security tab, here's where we can specify the type of authentication and security that we're using. If we're using AAA servers, it's here we'd specify AAA. If we had a QoS policy, it'd be under the QoS tab. All of this are under the details of that wireless network. This is actually part of the profile for that wireless network that we're looking at. And so not every feature is implemented in Packet Tracer, but it's, I'm, okay, I'm okay with it. I used to teach, uh, back when it was a certification, CCNA Wireless, I taught that at CBT Nuggets. And that course, if you're a CBT Nuggets member or if you want to subscribe into a trial, there's still the CCNA Wireless course, which goes through on a, a wireless LAN controller, the details and nitty gritty on how to set everything up and set up security and, and EAP and 802.1x and additional features. But as far as learning the basics of where stuff is, this is a great way to go. So the controller, wireless, here's our two access points, security, which is where we'd set up our radius server information. Man and so it only takes, if you lab this up and go through the, the tabs, it's pretty easy in just a couple passes in a few minutes to kind of remember where stuff is. Also, if you want to create a new wireless network, that's also a great exercise. You go back to wireless LANs, click on create new, 
And then you put in the details for that wire, new wireless LAN, wireless LAN. And the one thing I forget is there's a button for enable. <laughs> and uh, just like on a live controller, if you don't click on enable, the new wireless LAN network will not come up. All right, so that is the wireless LAN controller. I am going to leave that window up. We are, that's from the perspective of the, clap, the client laptop who's managing the controller. And let's bring in the smartphone to the party. So we'll click on the smartphone. Oh, hold on a second. It's going to hover. Oh, so great. See, it has a, has a 169 address. It, there's, it has no connectivity to a wireless network, so it's lost. So we'll click on it, go to config, and we'll go to wireless zero. And we'll put in our Wi-Fi network, which I'm going to hover over one of these access points, which was Wi-Fi-1. Wi All right. So we'll go back to that device. We'll type in that SSID, Y-FI-1. <laughs> was it, were there two dashes? I need to go check. I'm so sorry. I want to make sure I get it right. And yeah, no dash. I didn't put a dash. Who put that together anyway? It was me. So it's Wi-Fi, W-I-F-I, dash one. And then we're using WPA2 with a PS key, which is fancy for pre-shared key, a manually hard-coded key. And it is uppercase Cisco. Let me move this over just a little bit. Because I want you to see something amazing when we connect. It'll actually show the association between the smartphone and the access point. So it's ISEO exclamation mark two three press enter and just wait for it if yeah and the crowd goes mild it associated with the access point and if we looked at its ip address right here in the bottom right can we see that on the screen yeah here it's ten zero zero one oh six it's been given an ip address from the dhcp server that tr because it's now associated with the network and we're, we have access that's that's it soup to functioning Wi-Fi network involving two access points, a controller, a DHCP server, and a client from the ground up. And from the time I started, it's less than 30 minutes. And that's with me explaining it as we went through. Now, what should happen is if we click on the screen and I click on this little back delete key here, now it gives me the, the black X of death. This is the delete option. Sometimes this is tricky because this is the select option. That's the delete option. So before you click on delete, make sure you've clicked somewhere else in the topology so it's not um, going to delete the device that you're looking at. So I'm like I'm selected this access point. I'm selecting the server. I want to click away on something else and then click on delete. I get the X. And I'm going to take this cable between the switch and access point zero and take a look at the smartphone. It lost connectivity and it reassociated <laughs> with another freaking access point, which is how it should work. So it's pretty darn amazing. And then I'm going to go back to the select view up here, not the delete. Go back to the smartphone and go to the desktop for the smartphone and just go to browser and let's go to the web server. It's still at 10.0.0.10. .0 it's enabled for web services. We'll click on go. And there's the home page for this web server. Here's a small page, back. Here's copyrights, back. Here's the image page, back. Here's the image, <laughs> back. So uh, it's pretty darn functional. And I wanna share with you one other thing before we take a quick pause and then take questions. It's really easy to add new networks with, wire, with a wireless LAN controller. You just, you go to the controller, you go to the wireless lands, you click on create new, you put in the details, what kind of authentication, and you go, you're in your set. It's also quite easy to add a AAA server. Uh, if you need any heads up on that, the online documentation at Cisco is great. Uh, my course called CCNA Wireless, which is still available at CBT Nuggets, if anyone wants to watch those pieces, that's still available. And you can also follow this video, the stream, and just build this from scratch. So I'll, here's all, what else I want to share with you, and that is this. This is the logical view. If we clicked on physical view right here, and then we use this option called intercity and just went right to the wiring closet. So I'm gonna click on rack. So I clicked on the compass, clicking on rack, and I'm gonna click on jump. For those people who really need a taste of that physical aspect, here's the rack of the gear we just put on the topology and the logical view. It racked us for us. Power distribution on top. Then we have our switch. Shows all the connectors. And then we have the server. And then we have the two access points. 
and then we have the wireless LAN controller. And if we clicked on them right here, it brings up the menu for it once again. So at the command line, there's not too much we can do with the actual controller, but if we're looking at uh, a case that we're looking at the server, just click on the server here, it brings up the window for all the services. You can take care of all of it right here. <laughs> yeah, it's it's pretty darn cool as a learning tool because it lets you go from nothing to a full functioning network in about 30 minutes. And then you can start building on that and tearing it down, practicing again. I also want to share with you something that's uh, pretty interesting. And that is, let me just bring up a window so I can make sure I'm giving you the right scoop here. Hold on one second. Hi, this is the side of the headshot. I'm just gonna bring this up in incognito so I can verify whether or not it works anywhere without any cookies. Yeah, it does, let me bring it up then. All right, thanks for your patience. So this is a web, pa a web page that I've had for a while. I haven't really used it in a long time. But it's called thekeithbarker.com. <laughs> and uh, you know, if you scroll down, it has videos, you can subscribe. It says links to my YouTube videos. You can subscribe for YouTube. But right here, in this window right here, Cisco PT, it has, let me bring this up just a little bit more. There we go. Oops, wrong window. This link right here, the Cisco PT Wireless LAN WLC network, that's the network I built last night. I just saved it as a zip file. And if you'd like to go to thekeithbarker.com, click there, it'll download that zip. And then all you need is Packet Tracer and you can open it up. So I would encourage you to build it on your own from, from scratch, but if you want to compare and contrast, like, oh, this isn't working. Why isn't it working? Either go through the video or go through the live stream recording again, or you can just look at my packet tracer file and literally everything I just did, short of removing that link <laughs> from the first access point, is all right there in that file. All right. I appreciate the opportunity to chat with you in these live streams. It's a lot of fun for me. And uh, a little heads up at CBT Nuggets, I just finished, what day is it? It's Wednesday. Happy Wednesday. I just finished on Monday a video on, on that at the CCNP level. And I am preparing to finish this week a series of videos on CBT Nuggets regarding multicast routing. I used to teach that at the CCIE level. And as I start to study that again, I'm like, ah, oh, feels, it feels good. It feels good because I have a major edge on somebody who's seeing it for the first time. But the opportunity to teach it and lab it up and dig, dive back in with the star comma G's and the S comma G's and PIM and sparse mode and dense mode and rendezvous points and all the multicast addresses involved. It's a lot of fun. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and take a quick sip of water and grab some, yeah, grab some water. When we come back, if you have any questions at the CCNA level, my focus for this whole channel these days is CCNA. If you have any questions about what we've just covered or packet tracer in general, and you want to answer it, just do an at Keith Barker so it gets my attention uh, and then select my name and then do your question. That way I can see them because there's been a lot of questions going up and down. I'll just start from now going down. So if you did something earlier that didn't get addressed that you want to ask regarding CCNA, please feel free to do it. I also want to give a shout out to a lot of great people who are moderating in the Discord channel. If you haven't joined that yet and want a place to chat and discuss and think about CCNA related things, that's the place to do it. And I'd like to thank all the moderators who have volunteered, you know, their time to, when they're in there, answering questions or escalating questions. And in Discord, if there's ever a chance or an opportunity where it's like, okay, we've talked about this. Keith, what do you think? Just at OG of IT, you'll find my link there and I'd be happy to jump in. And that's probably the best way to reach me these days. I also have an email at contact at thekeithbarker.com but I only check that like once a week and sometimes that gets pretty full with a lot of stuff. So the Discord is probably the best option to reach me if you want to. All right, um, subscribe if you haven't already. Enjoy the journey as you learn, share with other people what you've learned and then keep on growing. And my goal for everybody on this channel is to have you outgrow what we're talking about here. Become a master at it and then come back and help other people in their journeys because it's a lot of fun. It also helps those people who've already learned it to by teaching it, it helps reinforce those concepts in your mind. 
All right, so I'm grabbing some water and I'll be back in just a few moments. And what we'll do is we'll take Q&A for, I've got a commitment where, well, I've, I need to leave at 6 p.m. Pacific time, which is an hour and 10 minutes. So my time is yours up till then if you want it. So I'll see you back in just a moment. Life is a winding road. No telling where it goes Driving through days and nights Won't stop for traffic lights And I, I really want to know really wanna... Okay, we are back And again, I'm just going to take a look at Starting now, going down for any questions that come up that have my name associated with them, because I know there's a lot of questions that are being answered by other people, which is fantastic. Thank you. Um, what did I want to share with you? Oh, maybe later. <laughs> okay, Darshan saying the website's going to increase from now on. Yep, it's going to probably have a few more hits. And if you like the Packet Tracer Labs, I think we could also, if you're into that, we could also do some more troubleshooting too, where I have a whole topology. And I say, here's the whole topology. It's all great, except this doesn't work. Why? And it could be a layer two problem. It could be a layer three problem. It could be an access control list problem. So if you'd like to see Packet Tracer Troubleshooting Labs in Discord in the recommended videos, let me know, because that's where I'm going these days to look and see about topics from the group. Make sure I get what you want. All right, Root Bear. Welcome, Root Bear. Glad to have you. Do you have any cyber ops content? Uh, not on this... Mm. So I've, I've been on YouTube since 2009, and there's a lot of videos here that I have created. So I'm bound to have many, many security-related videos. But for CyberOps, what Cisco did was they didn't they, – they're keeping the CyberOps associate. And based on the feedback, a lot of it from this channel, I've looked into it, and there's going to be a new test that's going to be given for Cisco CyberOps. And CBT Nuggets will be making content on that. But as far as this channel, my goal is to do CCNA only, sort of like the instructor hours, chatting, helping people, working on CCNA, those types of things. And probably most of the content outside of CCNA, I, I won't be focusing on here. Like I, I had a temptation the other day. I was doing EIGRP. I thought, oh, I can show this. And then I realized, you know what, Keith, stay on target, stay on target. You're... This community who's studying for CCNA is going to appreciate it if I stay on target. And that's what I'm going to do. So probably not too many topics outside of CCNA on this channel. If you're looking for CCMP level content, I probably have a few dozen videos on, C on, on YouTube already. But as far as this playlist and the focus going forward for quite a while, it's going to be CCNA. But I'm glad you're here, Root Bear. It's fantastic to have you. All right. Uh, and uh, let me bring the mic over. S P O A T Y underscore Yote is saying something about a four-digit code. So the um, I don't I don't know what that's in regards to. So if you could rephrase that with a few more words, that would be really helpful. Let me also repaste the link to join the Discord server, which is right there. Just did it. And that's a web link. So you open that from a web browser and that'll take you. And if you have the app installed for Discord, it'll still get you uh, from the web. It'll get you dialed in so you can join us. Love to have you. And Michael's asking, hi, Michael. Welcome. Are you ever going to walk through some of the uh, Cisco's small business products, RV routers in connection with Packet Tracer? Mm, because those, I don't recall those being anywhere on the CC... NA, I probably am not going to focus on that. So my apologies there. If I find, like for wireless, I was I was reminded it, from a lot of discussions from people who have recently seen an exam that the wireless LAN controller stuff is something that's horribly lacking and for people's experience and exposure. And that's why I wanted to take a few minutes and create that stream today to let you know that Packet Tracer can be used for wireless LAN controllers to give you a quick and easy way to set it up, practice with it. And once you've practiced with it a few times, you can answer, if you need to answer questions about it or even work with it, 
you know where stuff is. And that's really the tricky part is which tab do I go to to configure the security, the AAA server, to add a new wireless network, see the status of the radios, etc. Okay, thanks for that question. Arsham's asking, I have, are stating, I have a valid CCNP, awesome, and I'd like to tackle CCA sometimes this year. Do I need to start from CCNA? What would be my cert track? Well, if you have a current valid CCNP, what I would, see, it's, this is tricky for me. This is new ground because even though I have a couple CCAs and I have lots of friends who are currently working in the current CCNA field, it used to be where you'd have a CCA written, which was geared towards the CCA. Now it's just the core exam from the track you want to go to, security or enterprise. And so the prerequisites for your CCA is the core exam from that track. So you have to take that. So that would be the starting point. You'd want to, you need to pass that exam. Hmm. If you currently have a CCNP, I think you still have to take the current core exam as a prereq for the CCA. I think that's how Cisco's playing it. So that's where I'd start. Identify the track that you want to go on, whether it's enterprise or security or data center or whatever it happens to be, and then focus on the blueprint for that core exam. Download it, look at all the bullet points, rank yourself one to five, five of them an expert, one, I don't know what that is, and then make sure you're at least a four or better on all of those items. And then for CCA prep, I still feel pretty strongly that, I've always felt this way, that you really kind of need a company coach, a company to help give you work with materials so you can laser your focus on those technologies which are most important. It was true back in 2001. I believe it's true now too. And to do that, you need a company that's on top of it. Somebody has many CCAs that are being certified every month, not just like we had two people three months ago, but people that are actually, that way that you can validate that their content is on topic. Like when I was studying for my first CCA back in 2001, it, the blueprint was pretty clear and and the training material I had was pretty clear, but they had specific tasks. One of them was uh, phones, voice over IP. And I, I've told this story before, but the short version is I didn't want to study. I was tired. I eight months, four, you know, four days a week studying for my CCA. I was like, I'm so tired. I don't want to do it anymore. And Ed Dunez, who is CCA 6784, I'm CCA 6783, we studied together. He encouraged me and said, you need to study this and do the labs. And I did the labs. And having that hands-on practice with those topics based on a vendor's you know, uh, workbooks that I could actually practice through gave me enough experience with that so that in the lab, in the last few minutes of day one, it was two days back then, I was like <laughs> hammering it in, picked up that one phone, the other one rang, Kathy, the proctor at the time, was right there. She heard the phone ring, and I thought, I have a chance of continuing to tomorrow based on having enough points, I believe. And then I didn't sleep well that night. So for CC, CCA, focus on the core. Make sure you're good with those. And then probably line up with some good workbooks from a CCA focus company. And there are several, there are several good ones in the world and in the States, INE, Intern Network. Internet work experts, which I worked for many years ago, like 10 years ago, is a good one. They're a nice, they're a good solid company. They make CCIE and CCNP and CCNA content as well. But I can speak from experience and also knowing people that have currently worked with them. They're a good company. I would endorse them. And there's some in other parts of the world too that are equally good. All right. Darshan's asking how to get seamless connectivity when there are multiple wireless line controllers and do, do they try? Okay. Um, as far as the enterprise and, and working with wireless LAN controllers and trunking and backhauling traffic and all those topics that are important for a functioning wireless network, my goal for the CCNA level is, do you know on the wireless LAN controller where things are? Like if I wanted to add a new case in point, if we wanted to add a new wireless network, if I could find my freaking mouse, there it is, found my mouse. Whew. I almost had a mouse, mouse attack, can't find the mouse. If we wanted to add a new wireless LAN controller, how would we go about that? Back to the logical view, go back to our laptop, here's our controller. I think we would go to maybe wireless local area networks, which we're at, and create new, click on go. We specify a profile, we'll call this profile two, and we'll call this Wi-Fi two, and apply, and now we're looking at the profile two which is associated with this new Wi-Fi network. So we go to security and specify the type, let's see here. 
So we can enable it here, and then why are, oh, I see, none. That's why there's, I was like, I was like why are there no options for pre-shared keys and stuff? So you select the type of authentication you want to use, then you can specify the details down here, pre-shared keys, you put in the key here, you can specify AAA servers that are specific for that, that group, that profile. There's the QoS policies, mappings, and advanced, and apply, oh, at least one WPA policy must be enabled. My, my excuse, I apologize. Okay, how about WPA2? Great, we'll use WPA2 and then we'll click on apply. Oh, and then it says, Keith, you call for a pre-shared key, you probably should put one in. Cisco, one, two, three, all right, apply. All right, so now that's done, what should be able to happen is that information we just configured on the controller should be, I'll save this so that if we reboot the controller, we'll keep it. Now that information that we just configured on the controller should be pushed down to the access point. So if we look at the access point, the one that's still connected and hover over it, see it has those two wireless networks there? So we could, in theory, and why not just do it? What's the name of that guy? Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi dash two, great. So we could go to the smartphone and go to config and go to wireless and change it to Wi-Fi dash two and I'm using the same password. And it should still work. Now let me, let me go ahead and take off, let me put on the wrong password. Oh, okay, one, two, three, four. Let me put on the wrong password. Okay, so the wrong password, see how he disassociated, he's not there anymore. And if I put the right password back on, that changes his attitude. So uh, as far as backhauling and keeping the same IP address in a different VLAN, even if you cross multiple access points, beyond the scope of what CCNA wants you to know. But what they do want you to know is on the wireless LAN controller, using the GUI, I mean, it says so specifically. <laughs> it says, con let me go back to the big screen. It says config, this is 2.9 2 on the blueprint for CCNA. Configure the components of a wireless LAN access for client connectivity using GUI only, such as Wireless LAN creation, just did that. Security settings, did that too. The QoS profiles, which was, we didn't put any specifics there, but it was there next to that. And also advanced WAN, wireless LAN settings. Those are those four tabs when we went to the details for that profile, for that wireless LAN that we created. Those are the four tabs. <laughs> so if they're asking what's on those or, you know, what, just look at the blueprint, go to the packet tracer, practice a few times and you'll know where they are. And the cool thing is this, if you and I, after we practiced the packet tracer, if we went to a corporate environment and they asked us to, hey, can you check out the settings on this wireless LAN controller? We would know to open up a browser with HTTPS, connect to the wireless LAN controller with the right credentials. We'd know where to go and we'd check the values and check the settings. I mean, it's it could be that simple. All right. Um, oh, the, uh, d let's see here. I have a question from Demetrio, thank you for that, asking what is the link for the packet tracer file? And all it is, this is not the application. You get the app packet, tra tra packet tracer application from netacad.com. Log in there, sign up for a free account if you don't already have one, and just download the packet tracer from them free, and they're happy to have another person learning packet tracer, learning Cisco is what the intent is. So let me copy the link where my site is. And it is thekeithbarker.com. I just pasted it a moment ago. Thank you for that request. Okay. All right. Uh, Gino is asking, um, as awesome as the o original Gangster of IT shirt is, where can I get one? I don't, I don't actually monetize anything on YouTube these days, but um, let me think about how, let me think about some reasonable way that I could get individuals who are supporting this channel, which really means they're learning or they're supporting others who are learning and get them rewarded with some shirts. Because I've got, I ordered about 100 for Cisco Live last year. They all got depleted. Most of them got depleted at Cisco Live. I've got a few reorder. I've got a few left and I'm going to order some more for Cisco Live in June as well. Let me figure out a, cr a clever way to get those to people for, <laughs> I want to do it for free. But my challenge is shipping overseas and things like that. It's not always really cheap. Like, these shirts, I buy them in bulk for like maybe $12, $11. I, I, I got three samples 
This is my OG of IT shirt, and uh, the, the sloth is wearing one right now. I got three samples of shirts. I thought, which one? It, I washed all three of them twice, and then I said, okay, which one of these shirts would I want to wear because it feels so good? And it just, you know, it hangs well on the, on the body. It feels soft. It feels like a good shirt, not one that you just get at a trade show. And that's the one I came up with is that tri-blend, which I think in bulk, they're like 11 bucks to me. And so I'd be happy to give those away to, um, but let me figure out a, a way to do it that where it won't cost $30. I feel so, I did that originally. I had a few people in Europe that I shipped to and it was like 30 bucks for one shirt. I was like, mm, there's got to be a better way. So I'll, fi- I'll sort that out. Give me some time to think about that. If you'd be patient with me, I'll find a way to get every every warm-blooded OG of IT fan who's either learning CCNA or wants to help other people with CCNA or just loves networking. I'll find a way to do it. Edgardo, thanks for the super chat. I, again, not required ever, but it's, I, I appreciate that. Um, I want this to be a resource that everybody can use. Okay. Do you know, says Root Beer, Hey, Rupert, do you know if Packet Tracer has external connectivity via hosts like GNS3? I've seen, I'm behind the I'm behind the curve with the new version of Packet Tracer. I know there's options for learners like students to merge their projects together so they can talk to each other, but I don't know of the options if they exist about merging Packet Tracer with the outside world, even in a tricky way. So let me look into that. Uh, actually, if you could do me a favor, Root Bear, on Discord, if you'd put that in the suggestions folder, any one of them, uh, just do an at OG of IT suggestion. So I'll be sure to see it. That way I won't forget. And that way I can go through my list and make sure I follow up on that. Cause I think if it's, op- if it's an option, I would love to do that. I mean, with GNS3, if you saw my old videos back in like eight years, seven years ago, a long time ago, when I was doing my first GNS3 series on dot eight <laughs> or dot oh eight or whatever it was, um, I had some fantastic times in connecting that GNS3 environment to the physical world. And I, always, I still love doing that. I have I now use VMware Workstation Pro because it's just so darn convenient with all its bells and whistles for a virtualized environment. And you can link those to public networks or to your physical networks and wireless networks. And that's fun. There's something about merging virtual and, and uh, physical gear and networks that is just how fun. Also, when I did CCNA Wireless, check this out. When I did CCNA Wireless, I had physical access points and they had a virtual wireless LAN controller, and all of them thought, thought they were on the same network, which was a lot of fun. Okay. Yeah, uh, Showhab is stating, since CBT Nuggets hasn't launched Encore yet, uh, what's, what should we do to prepare? Good question. I would get the blueprint. I would uh, get a book. I mean, most people are going to use several study materials, was what I've discovered. When I was teaching back in the day, I was doing IE level training like maybe 10, 12 years ago, and Everybody I talked to, I say, what are you using to study? And they were using all the major vendors' products to study, most of them. And because they were re- the ones that were reasonably priced, they weren't going to three different $10,000 boot camps, but they were getting the books and labs and so forth. So I would say get a book. Not every book is going to be perfect, but Cisco Press has some good books that are, oh, their Encore book isn't quite out yet either. <laughs> I just looked yesterday for somebody. So as soon as the Cisco Press, oh, wait, it's out. What was I thinking? Oh, it was a security book that wasn't out. My apologies. Because I've been, I've been uh, the Encore book from Cisco Press, which Jason Gooley and three other authors wrote. There's no such thing as a perfect book, but it's a good resource. And so I would say get a book, go to amazon.com, do uh, 350-401, which is the exam number for Encore. See what people are saying. If there's two or three choices regarding a, a book, Take the one, if it has more than 20 or 30 votes, that's a 4.5 or higher, that'd be a good move. And I think the Cisco Press book is a good resource as well. I use it as I study. And also I use three or four different resources too when I study, I do. I use the official documentation almost every time. I wanna see what Cisco is saying about Cisco. <laughs> like NAT inside, NAT outside, what is their position? What are they saying? And then I have other training resources that I go to. And so I, I have a Safari Books online account, which gives me access to the whole technical library from Safari and Cisco Press. It also includes videos. I'm longtime fans of many trainers that are out there. Uh, Kevin Wallace is a great resource. We used to work together many, many years ago. I've probably known him for 18, 19 years. And so wherever you find training that works for you, that you can trust, that's also a big thing, I would use that. So thanks for your interest in Encore from CBT Nuggets. 
I wish it was done. <laughs> I do. Um, my part, I see here, I have one last part. The last part I have, I may have two parts left. I have one or two parts left, and my parts will be done by the end of March, But uh, which is within, of this date, it is less than 20 days away. I'll be completely done. However, it's a team effort. So there's a lot of people. Jeremy Char is working on it with us. Chuck Keith is working on it with us. A lot of great people. Jeff Kish is working on it with us. Knox Hutchinson's working on it with us, I believe. Yeah. So five trainers all working on it. And then once it's made and uploaded, it's all, it's, it, we do peer reviews and to, an, to a really good amount. We want to make sure everything's right. We have labs. We want to make sure the labs all work. And so if you're willing to wait, we're, we're glad to have you. If you can't wait, start studying. Don't let it hold you back. But it's it's going to be dy- – it is – I've seen the content I've made. I've seen the content Jeremy's made. I've seen the content Knox has made and Jeff so far up to this point. And it's all very, very good. So it'll be worth the wait. All right. Uh, so R- Risky's asking, is it possible to connect Packet Tracer to the Internet? If it's possible to bridge Packet Tracer to a physical or wired network, which I need to investigate, it's on my list, then yes, it would be. I mean, once we get to any network, then you have that same connectivity and you can add it out to the public network as well. But I haven't I haven't heard a lot about that, so we'll have to see what the actual result is of that. Can the two APs in different Wi-Fi profiles communicate with each other? So one of the benefits of having a this from Darshan, one of the benefits of having a controller is that those APs can work together. So we could have certain APs that are supporting certain Wi-Fi networks and certain APs that are not. We could also dial down, we could do site surveys and dial down the amplification from 100% to 80% so it doesn't spill over into an unintended area. So as far as uh, can they communicate with each other, it's really the, the controller that's getting all the data and making calling all the shots as we're coordinating a, a pattern that will cover the entire network. So if they're seeing each other's signals, they're communicating that information of who they see and so forth back to the controller who can then make sense of it. All right. Milos, welcome. I looks like uh, Mike, Milos has a question. What do you recommend using for remembering the steps, commands for configuring certain configurations for real work stuff? Mind maps, regular text with explanations, lab examples. So for me, for like if there's a if there's a five-step process to do something, I'm a good one for documentation. Uh, documenting our processes are one of the most critical overlooked steps that many people forget to do. So if like rolling out or onboarding a device, there should be templates involved and steps and change control that's followed. And so ideally, when we have to do something that's new or, or, or repetitive, ideally we have a checklist and we can automate a lot of that to get all the pieces done and not forget. And then a lot of times security breach, breaches come into companies because somebody was in a hurry, they rolled out something and they forgot to turn off dynamic trunking, for example. Dynamic trunking, if it's on and we have that port hanging off in a cube somewhere and somebody gets Kali Linux and they plug in, they form a trunk and they now have access to every single VLAN in our enterprise. No, <laughs> yeah, no need to go through any router security because we now have direct access to all those VLANs with a port that wasn't configured. So a template, as far as me memorizing things, how would I memorize? I usually make act like mnemonics. Like we had a, a video on the OSPF neighbor states. And I thought, what's a good way to remember this? And I thought, let's make a mnemonic. So I made the mnemonic of IT Elf. You know, the IT Elf who helps people at Christmas, the IT Elf who helps people at uh Ramadan or whatever your holiday is, I should say. The IT Elf is there to help neighborships. And if you think of IT Elf and you say it a few times, it's hard to forget. If you see the picture, you've now heard it, see the picture. And then it's just a matter of saying, oh, IT Elf, init, two-way, X start, exchange, loading in full. I guess I know these neighbor states. And that stuff is hard to forget. So that's one way of doing it with a mnemonic of some type. Hands-on practice is a great thing. Like one of the things that's surprising to some people is AD, administrative distance, which has nothing to do with which route from the routing table is going to be selected, which is a common mistake. AD has everything to do with who got into the routing table. I mean, once routes are in the routing table, 
then it's a whole nother ball game as far as which ones are chosen. So I have a video in this playlist called, the, uh, the master play is called uh, Why Routes Have to Win Twice. <laughs> they have to get in the routing table, then they have to be selected from the routing table based on the longest match. So where was I going with? Oh yeah, so for CCNA, there's no EIGRP officially, right? To it's not on the blueprint, T test is fair. And there's no BGP, it's not on the blueprint. However, if we were asked, you have the same network of 10.10.10.0, it's a slash 24 bit mask, and it's being advertised by external BGP and EAGRP and RIP and OSPF, which one, is, which one of those routes would be in the routing table? And then that's the moment in an exam where you'd say, oh, I wish I'd studied that a little bit. <laughs> Not studied EIGRP or ISIS or external or internal BGP, or external BGP, but rather just knowing what those values are. And a big, a really important way of learning that is hands-on. That because if you see it enough times, like let's imagine you're setting the administrative distance for OSPF, which is just the command distance space question mark, and it shows you the laundry list of all the different. I see. Does it? I don't. Oh wait, wait. I have a. I don't have a router up. But let me show you how easy it is to bring a stinking router up. <laughs> I mean, that's one of the benefits of Packet Tracer. So if you need a router, just bring one up. So we'll just click down here on the uh, network devices, and we'll just grab a 2911. It'll do. Great. And it's powering up. Boom. So we'll just double click on it, go to the CLI. It's booting. <laughs> Thanks for making us wait. But you know what? I, I, I kid because it's fantastic. Uh, do I want to enter the initial config? I do not. But I would like to go into privilege mode, and I would like to set a host name. So I'll do that from configuration mode. Host name, Bob. Uh, no, not Bob. Uh, let's use uh, R1. And then line console zero. <laughs> Logging synchronous. That's the way we don't have to go insane before our time. And no exec timeout. Maybe there's a dash there, probably is. Yep. Oh, oh, I've made this mistake before. I did no exec, pressed enter. That means no shell on the console. <laughs> like, oh, I just toasted myself. I can no longer access from the console because I said no exec. So no exec timeout or set your timeout for a longer time in a lab environment. And then L, as far as other warmups, we might want to do a no IP domain lookup. I, no IP domain. And why are you barking at me? Huh, just wants to be difficult. Okay, so no IP domain lookup, so that if I do a typo, it doesn't try to telnet to that address. If I do, if I boot the machine, it's not gonna, oh, also no service config. It may not be on this. Have you ever seen that? Oh, it doesn't even know what that is. So packet tracer says, I don't know what that is. So on a live gear, have you ever seen a device boot up and it's, it's doing a broadcast, it's looking for a config file, trying to download it? <laughs> Uh, the no service config will say, hey, but don't bother looking for a config file. You're you're all by yourself. All right, so what we want to do is uh, router. I need, if I tried to router OSPF right now, it would bark because there's no router ID available. There's no no IP address. So we'll do interface loopback zero and IP address 10.0.0. Oh, it's, a, I, I don't, I don't, if I connect this, I need a different network than what I'm currently using. So let's do 10.1.0.1 with a 20. yeah, I probably won't connect this to the rest of the network. All right, so again, IP address and then router OSPF one network, bring everything in area zero, do show IP interface brief. Look at that. Even Packet Tracer supports a do in front of that. So there's the do show IP interface brief. Want to make sure my loopback was up. And let's do a show IP OSPF interface brief. We should have, oh, well, Packet Tracer, I just gave you a big boost. And then you said, yeah. So we can't do the brief command. It's not supported. But we can just do a show IP OSPF interface. And here we can verify that we have our loopback address. It's enabled for OSPF. And. Oh, so we're in router config. Let's do a distance, question mark. Oh, look at that. It's not going to tell us. 
So it seems to me there's somewhere where it tells us the administrative distances for all the routing protocols in the CLI, but maybe I'm just dreaming that. So what I'd recommend is that, so if I did distance here, if I said distance of 90, that means OSPF learned routes are no longer a value AD of 110, which is their default. They'd now be a value of 90. <laughs> so if I need, and now if I had E, I, I should make, I'll make it something different. I'll make it 91 because EIGRP is 90, and then we don't want to have a battle, especially at the CCNA level, about uh, which one's going to win, your OSPF or your your OSPF or your EAGRP when they both have an administrative distance of 90. That's that's like a CCIA trick type of question that wouldn't be relevant for a CCNA level. But on live gear, you could put them in and dial it in and see which ones would be believed. I'm curious now. That's how my brain thinks. What would happen if that <laughs> Those are corner niche cases. But so going back to... ISIS and external BGP, which has an AD of 20, by the way, and things like um, RIP 120. If you know what those administrative distances are, and then you get a question that's asking, hey, have all these routes, which one would be going to the routing table, you'd know which one was lower. And, and you could also do a process of elimination based on the ones that you did know. So even though EAGRP and OSPF and ISIS are not studyable, I would definitely just want to be aware of what those default OSPF what those default ADs were going forward. All right, next question. Do I plan on taking the exam? I do, sooner than later. I wanted to give a few weeks for them to get out any kinks from what I've heard, and because I haven't taken the exam, I don't know. I, I, haven't, I don't have personal knowledge yet, but in the past, they had simlets where you'd have to go in and do stuff, like config this, config that, put an access list on, or what have you, and those were pretty fun because I could spend some time in there and t look around, what happens if I do this? What happens if I do that? How good is the sim? And from everything I'm hearing up to this point, and Cisco could change it, everything's multiple guess or matching or, or drag and drop. So you can you know, drag and drop the order of something or multiple guess, multiple choice with either a single answer or multiple choices and they'll be very clear if there's one choice or three choices. Usually you have a radio button where there's just one single choice and then check boxes where it says two or three, but they'll tell you. They, they won't say, unless they say choose all that apply, which is not something that I've heard regarding this exam. So yeah, I'm going to take it sooner. Uh, when I do, I will do a live stream just on it. I watched, I, who did I watch? Uh, I work with Jeremy Chara and Chuck Keith, uh, Network Chuck, excuse me. It's like, who's Chuck Keith? And I watched their live stream Monday night. It was super good. They both had taken it and they both talked about it. And Jeremy they, they're very different people and they have different attitudes about the exam and they talked about it. I watched the whole thing. I don't normally watch the whole whole live stream because I mean, I watch parts of things that are interesting to me. I watched the whole thing. I enjoyed the whole thing. Uh, I think Network Tech is great. I think Jeremy's great and I had fun with it. So anyway, they, they both took it and I think I have enough. I mean, I, I need to brush up a little bit more on my software to find networking which is what I'm studying for Cisco Live. I'm teaching that at Cisco Live, so I'm going to be a, a moderate, a professional level or better before Cisco Live. I'm also going to um, take both the DevNet Associate exam and also the CCNA before Cisco Live, which is in June. So as far as when, I will let you know. Stay tuned. But uh, when I do take it, though, and when I come back into a live stream, I'm going to go through my videos in this playlist. I've got the CCNA master playlist. And I'm just betting that virtually every single live stream is going to be on a scale of one to five, five being the most important. I bet you we're all going to be fours and fives for all the live streams that I've done. <laughs> because I've been specifically picking to topics that are important, not only for certification, but also for the real world. And I'll be able to verify that. And based on the feedback I've gotten, uh, we're spot on. And the CBT Nuggets content too, by the way, is more than enough to pass and very, very good. All right. That was based on Milo's question. I, I kind of ranted for a minute there. Thanks. Oh, and Jermaine's question. Okay, Office to Crazy. Cisco Meraki, cloud-based controller, automates and pushes down WAN configurations. Um, yep, so Meraki's fantastic. So Meraki is owned by Cisco and their products are amazing and they are GUI based and they don't take a lot of serious thinking and work to make it click. 
Cisco Meraki isn't part of CCNA. Um, as a, <laughs> so as a result, I probably won't be focusing on it too much in this channel, but it is a reality. Um, and I imagine as Meraki gets a bigger footprint for small offices and even for bigger networks, I'll tell you what I love about Meraki is that this whole thing about the controller that we just did, in Meraki there's a controller, but the controller's in the cloud. <laughs> and so you just log on to your Meraki account in the cloud and your access points have access to that cloud controller and you say what you want to have happen, it rains those configs down and it's done. And it's, uh, so as far as like the tabs and so, there's, there's, it, there's different areas in the Meraki interface you can go to in the, in the cloud controller, but it's a great product. It's not part of the CCNA. But it's a great product. All right, moving down. Okay, thanks. Uh, Jorge is saying that the scorebook is out in May. That's the target for the uh, CCNP level security book. Fantastic. Good, good, good. Yep, and Encore 350.401 is out. Perfect, perfect. All right, Michael is asking, can we do network automation on Packet Tracer? Also, will you be uploading Packet Tracer Labs for the previous topics you covered in the CCNA playlist? I, I think, Michael, instead of going back, we'll just go forward. And so if you have a request for, if you'd like to see a lab on something, maybe it's spanning tree, maybe it, just make that a separate request. And what I'd like to do, I think it'd be valuable, is if we did the live stream and I actually built it, which would only take just moments to do. If I built it, and that way I could give you a, a walkthrough as I build it, like access ports, trunk ports, et cetera, et cetera. And then I can make ex that exact topology that I built live available. I think that would add a lot more value. That way somebody who could, so they could watch this video, go up to the, the website, thekeithbarker.com, download it and have it and start working with it. Also, if I did a troubleshooting video, I could put it there as well. So I think instead of trying to go back, uh, one of the techniques that I've, <laughs> I hope you'll, uh, you'll buy with me on this. One of the techniques that I've, time is valuable. Every human matters, every human no matter what your faith-based beliefs are or your politics are, every human matters. And we only have a, a limited amount of time. I would love nothing more than to impact a billion people for the good. Let me point that out. <laughs> I don't know that that will ever happen. But if I shoot for a large number, if we, it's not just one, if we shoot for a, helping a lot of people, let's say there's 20,000 people a month working on their CCNAs, which is prob probable. A lot of people. If we can help every one of those people with stepping stones and and getting what they need and better understanding a concept or having that light bulb go off, it's a win. It's a win for them. Their life is going to get better. They're going to learn more skills. They'll be more valuable to their families, employers. That's the way we can make a difference by impacting just a boatload, um, modifying my words there, a boatload of people uh, to to do better. So as far as time, my full-time gig is CBT Nuggets. I, I work about 40 hours a week in making content for them. And I spend probably half of that time researching, studying, labbing. Because our my intent is for those CBT Nuggets, which for me are fairly short. If it's a, if there's no lab involved, it may be five to eight minutes. If there's a lab involved, it may be seven to 12 to 15 minutes because I'm demonstrating the lab that I want you to practice on. So my goal is to master, not master, but to remind myself of how the technology works, put myself in the shoes of the person who's learning it, whether it's a entry level or a professional level, and then deliver it as concise as I possibly can. And then that takes two or three hours usually for one video. So one five to 10 minute video takes two or three hours. So with these live streams, my goal is that with a live stream, you get a lot more of the, hey, my, what comes to memory is that when I when I put in uh, on a a switch when I did the VLAN inter I put a VLAN interface no IP routing so it wasn't an IP router had no default gateway and then it actually was able to talk to a remote network I was like oh my gosh this is like you know stuff that happens all the time and I'm so glad it was caught on film because it's now part of the historical record and people learn from that. It's like, oh, I didn't know that happened. That's cool. So I'm doing the live streams because there's no, not a lot of editing. Because if I was going to do this, all these topics that I did uh, so far, and we have like close to 40 videos now, it's more of a here's the topic. We're going to talk about it, demonstrate it, do some really fun analogies, make sure you get it, walk away with a smile on your face, pause, then take questions and answers. 
that people have, then leave that as part of the, as part of the video as well. By doing that and not having to go back and edit all that, I can continue to do three streams a week, which is what I'm doing. And based on the response, the channel is almost at 100,000, which is, <laughs> I can't believe it. It's amazing. And that's because of you and getting getting the word out. Like, hey, if you're studying for your CCNA, you should probably uh, check out Keith's videos. Um, also, CBT Nuggets, we have a very strong offering there. It's not free. It's behind a, a subscription. But if your budget allows or if you want to check it out for a free trial, I, I would recommend if it's in your parameters, check it out as well. It's really good. Jeremy Char, myself, and, and Chuck Keith. So where were they going? Okay. Um, so we're not, I'm not going to go back and look at all the other the last videos and make new packet tracer files for it. But what I will do is going forward, if there's a request for it, based on what you want to see, we can do new content. And then where packet tracer can be used, we'll add that. As far as automation, that was also a question here from Michael. Can we do automation on packet tracer also? Uh, you'll be uploading packet. Mm, I I haven't looked at the automation piece yet for what's available inside of of packet tracer. I imagine there might be something, but what I was, but what I do have planned for you, you're gonna love, because I'm gonna walk you through a thing called Postman, and all Postman is is an application. The you know we when we talk to Cisco routers like we are now, we go to the console. Here we go. That's our that's our communication path. But when we have a controller, like we have our wireless line controller talking to the access points using a technology or a protocol or technology called CapWAP. And if we're talking to a router or a switch from a controller, we're gonna be using something else other than just a CLI. We're gonna be using something called an application programming interface. So instead of a command line interface, this is it. It's an application program interface that sends and receives information back and forth. And a lot of times it uses HTTP and HTTPS. And so what we can do is we can use scripts and commands, including Python and an application type called RESTful APIs. And I intend, as part of these videos, is to give you a nice, warm, easy, gradual welcome to that world and also in measurable terms, how you can actually do it with public sites and actually do APIs through Postman on your own just to give you that warm up so you can, oh, I get it, I did this. <laughs> uh, Bart Castle is another team member here at CBT Nuggets. He's working in AWS, at, uh, that's his focus. His name is Cloud Bart, you should find him on YouTube, he's super. And what Cloud Bart, Bart Castle did, did he, he wrote these APIs or enabled APIs in Amazon Web Services so that if somebody sent an API, just think of an API like the language of love between a computer and another computing device, the way they agree to receive comments and what frameworks they're gonna, like the structure, like a YAML structure, and also the types of things that we're willing to receive and come back. We'll talk more about that with authentication tokens. And but what he did was, he invited me to participate. He goes, Keith, uh, here's your credentials. If you want, you can send me, uh, you can use Postman and you can send me an API, send, an a, send a command through my API at Amazon Web Services and it will send me an email. I, it was fun. And that's what I'm gonna do for you guys too. Something that you can do from your own computer, whether it's Mac, Windows, Linux, with free software like Postman and get a flavor of how to use APIs. And with DevNet from Cisco and dCloud, there's some very free options for testing APIs against live gear that otherwise might cost tens of thousands of dollars to have. So all that's coming. That's a little sneak peek. I did it after the you know the Q and A break because I wanted to make sure I'm not gonna. Oh, it was all. we'll do it nice and gradual, and we'll make it fun. And so by the time you're done, by the time we're done with this live series, by the time we're done, you'll say API, shim API, got it. I understand. And then you can actually explain it. So if your boss or somebody else says, what's this whole thing about network automation and programming? You can have an elevator pitch that you can explain and understand behind the scenes regarding how it works. So I don't know that Packet Tracer, which I'm looking at right here, has a lot of automation capabilities in it, but the DevNet cloud does, DevNet and also dCloud and also free tools that we can use on our computer. That's all coming up. Okay, um, next question. What are macros on a Cisco switch? If I remember, this is going back 10 years, I think the last time I thought about macros, there's only so much memory on a switch. And so what we can do with macros, we can allocate, if, if I'm remembering this correctly, we can allocate it to MAC addresses or 
I think there are like three categories. I forget. Maybe one's routing on a multi-layer switch. Anyway, the, I believe the macro is setting up the switch to allocate certain portions of memory in a larger degree, like a bigger slice of the pie, for certain functions. Whether it's for MAC addresses, if you intend to have lots and lots of MAC addresses, and there was two other ones. Maybe one, maybe one was QoS for QoS functions, but I <laughs> I recall that's what the macros were, and it's either that or something completely different. But I think that's it. Okay, and let me see. Going down the list. Thanks for the questions, everybody. It's good to have you. We've got 218 people online. It's every single person here. I'm grateful for. And that includes people who are learning, people who know and are helping others, and people who are here just to help reinforce what they already know or maybe pick up a tidbit. It's great to have you. I've been doing networking since, well, I started IT in 1985. That was my journey. And then in 1987, 19, no, it's 1980. Yeah, I guess 1987, 1988, I got into networking, got into Cisco. Nine, I think I slipped a decade. <laughs> I got my first CCI in 2001. I'll have to go to my LinkedIn profile and look. Anyway, I started my IT career in 85, and then after that, it's just all a, all an upward blur. But I'm I'm glad to do it. All right, so Infosec Pad is asking, oh, Edgardo is asking, why is it a good practice not to use VLAN 1? I know it's for security purposes, but what scenario does that mean? Can you give us some examples? So, um, the default for switches is VLAN 1. So imagine... We had a 24 port or 48 port switch, and we hadn't. We just left the defaults, and then we said, "Oh, we're going to use VLAN 10 for uh, sales, and we're use VLAN 20 for marketing, and VLAN 30 for engineering." And each one of those VLANs, which is a layer two broadcast domain, is going to have a separate logical layer three IP address network as well. That's all great, but if we if we if we use VLAN one as our management VLAN which means that's how we're communicating to our switches. So if we're sitting at a PC and we're remote SSHing to a device that's four routers away, well, four switches away on VLAN 1, for example, and we're using that, an attacker who's on a port that hasn't been configured would be on VLAN 1. So the default puts the attacker who's just found an open port and a cube on the same VLAN as your management network, which is access to the IP addresses of all your devices. So ideally, in a secure environment, the first thing that some people do, they use a template and a checklist, they take all the switch ports and they put them into VLAN 999, which doesn't go anywhere. It's the dead end. There's no router interfaces on 999, it's just a dead end. And then, as they start to carve out access ports for production VLANs 10, 20, and 30, and 40, if they forgot any, they're in that dead end VLAN, it's more secure. Also, a default, a really good default, is to make sure that all the ports are not trunking, meaning they're not willing to trunk. It's not as easy as it seems to tell a switch port not to be able to dynamically trunk. They want to. So there's a few conditions that exist for that. One is to do uh, switch, uh, make it an access port, not a dynamic port. So if you make a port an access port, switch port mode access, that means it won't trunk. So for all your ports, if we put them in VLAN 999, we made them all access ports by default. That way, if we forget about a port and our attacker accesses a port through a cube, not in the wiring closet or the data center, but through a cube, they're basically going nowhere. There's no DHCP services, no other devices are there. And that would be, a, and then you could choose to use VLAN 10 or some other VLAN as your management VLAN if you don't have out of band management. Also, you could make VLAN 10 across the board your native VLAN. So no tags are required when trunking. That's also very possible. That way, if trunking fails for some reason and you're using the native VLAN of 10 and you're not, uh, and you're not tagging on it, then your VLAN 10 traffic would still work. So that's, that's one of the reasons. Basically, it's the default. And most environments, many environments, it's dangerous because their management network <laughs> and the default for all the switches are VLAN 1. I'm thinking about doing a video. No, it's not CCNA. See, I got to keep in my lane. I was thinking about doing a video on double tagging. A lot of people asked, have asked about that. I was thinking about getting a Kali Linux box and actually doing double tagging to show how you can slip past. But after, after CCNA, I, I, I retract that thought. <laughs> I no longer have that thought. Uh, I want to, I love what I do. I love security. I love networking. And, um, 
I love sharing. Thanks everybody for being here. Okay, so are you doing the new CCNA? And the answer is, uh, at CBT Nuggets, I, I, we did create the new CCNA and as far as, the, as far as the exam, I'm going to be taking that and the DevNet Associate exam before Cisco Live, which is June. And if they cancel Cisco Live because of that little virus thing going around, I shouldn't say little, man, it's just taking the world by storm. If they cancel the physical event, I still am going to take it before the date of Cisco Live, which is like the f first or second week in June. So I'll give everybody an update. I'll do a live stream and I'll, I'll go down the blueprint and I'll rank them for you based on my experience. Not telling you what I had, just saying how important are these items, in my opinion, after I've set the exam. And I, I already have a really great idea. I bet you, in fact, let me do this. I'm going to, before I take that exam, I will get a fresh blueprint with a nice pen and I will rank what I believe are the most important parts. I'll rank them one to five, five being high, one being low. Then I will date that. I won't put it in an envelope and mail it to myself. Or maybe I will, yeah. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll keep you honest. I'll keep myself honest. I'll rank that. And then when I go take the exam, I'll compare that against what my experience was. And you know they may have a pool of a thousand questions or you know everybody's test is gonna be a little bit different. But I'll bet you, I'm really close on what's important to know and what surprised me. And I can share that with you. My motivation is please learn everything. Please learn everything on the blueprint. If you see a bullet point and you're at a three, move it to a four. If you're at a four of that topic, for CCNA, you don't really need to push it to a five. But before you take the IE stuff, you would. Thanks for that question. And I see Gus in here answering questions. Thank you, Gus, and everybody else who's answering questions. All right. Okay, Matthew has a great question. Given that Cisco is moving to the iOS XE-based controllers, will we see qu exam? Qu We're not, I haven't seen the exam, but based on the blueprint, which I, I feel is extremely accurate based on all the feedback I've had, they're not gonna ask us any questions that have left field about the XE operating system from Cisco. So nothing specific, just, just straight up meat and potatoes, layer two, layer three, security, Automation, just the concepts of automation, and some wireless. And also as part of that, IPv6 and IPv6 static routing. All right, good question, great question. Let's see here. All right, Dubon, I don't know the answer to that. Um, yep, I don't know the answer to your question, Dubon, I, I apologize. I don't think, I think it's, I don't think a CC. I don't think the CCNA blueprint is asking for it either. But just for myself, I don't recall the answer to that question on the top, off the top of my head. All right, another question from Manuel regarding Encore from CBT Nuggets. It's my my content will be done completely by end of March, and I know there are some other team members who are working very hard making the best content possible for it. I don't know the exact dates for them. They may or may not ask other trainers to come in and help with some of that. So I would just say. If you subscribe to CBT on Twitter, uh, that would be a great way because they will be announcing on Twitter and other social media when it comes out. So that would be the fastest way to get the accurate scoop of when it comes out. I would love it to be soon, 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 but I, it, I don't think it'll be the end of March anymore. I used to think that was true, and now I's, my content will be done, but I'm not quite, not quite there for the whole project. All right, um, Dan. Hi, Dan. Uh, another great video, thank you. As for configs on PT Packet Tracer, the command requires a dash no ID, IP domain lookup. Hmm. So let's take a look at that. I'm game. Let's take a look. So on a router like this 2911, if we do a show run, show run <laughs> pipe include no. There we go. So I just, what this command does, uh, show run, you're probably familiar with, and the pipe says filter based on the following output. I did a shortcut for include, and then I said no, which means it's only gonna show lines of output that have the word no in them. A, uh, a simulator like, well, this simulator supports it, so that's great. So yeah, right there, look at that. So here's, here's the scoop on that command. And thank you, Dan, for pointing that out. I appreciate it. I I believe the newest version of that command is no IP domain space lookup. 
but they both work, IP, at least in a live router. No, I see here. No IP domain lookup. So it takes that, and it takes that, <laughs> and they both do the same thing, but if we do a control C, get out of there, and do a up arrow key, it puts the dash in. So one of those two commands is older than the other. And on live gear, and I could be wrong, I don't have I don't have a lab up at the moment. Otherwise I just go to some live gear and try it. I believe it's the no I believe the domain space lookup is the current syntax. Anyway, what was what this router is doing, it took both commands, no problem, and then it put in the command that it felt it should have. And because this is a simulation, they could have either used the current flavor or the old flavor and Either one will work. So the command would be domain dash lookup or domain space lookup. They both work. And then in the config, now I'm dying to know. So Dan, I know you've got some gear. If you want to do that in live gear, do a no IP domain space lookup and then take a look at the running config and let me know. I am curious. If you have time to do that before the live stream ends, I would be interested in seeing that. We've got 15 more minutes before I need to bolt. My cat had some surgery today, so I need to go back to the, oh, I did, this is what my hair looks like with, um, no product. <laughs> yeah. I was talking to some neighbors, a uh, young child that was, and the neighbors were touch. Yeah. <laughs> Keith, what do you mean? I was talking to uh, one of my neighbors down the street and he was on a motorcycle and his sister was with him, like, she was like, probably six or seven years old. And she looked at me and said, what do you put in your hair to make it gray? <laughs> I said, I'm 55, comes with the territory. Uh, it was great. So anyway, this is what I looked like with no product. I was in a, bit, a little bit of a rush. Anyway, my, my cat had a procedure today. It's a kitten, so you can, might, might want to imagine what that procedure is. And I'm going to go comfort that cat while my wife goes sings in the circus. She is a performer, a singer at Cirque du Soleil. She sings at O. So she's on tonight, and she's going to work. Ah, she's already on her way to work. So the cat has a small window with nobody there. So I'm going to leave this studio and go and... Check out the cat. I uh, hope he's fine. I'm sure he will be. All right, more questions. Okay, okay, great, 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 great. Just looking for one's my name. Uh, Matthew's asking, what do you think is the best way to study with Cisco prep books or with video content? And that totally depends. Have you noticed that sometimes people, when they watch, they get their news, some people are readers. They want to read the news. And other, like just even if it's in uh, like a digital format, they want to read it versus watch it. My wife and I are opposite with that. Like me, I have, I have a limit. I watch 15 minutes of news a day on what I, I wish, well, on what is a fairly neutral, like Associated Press flavor of reporting. And so not too much, you know, suggestibility and motivation one way or the other. I just want to know. You know, how many people have the coronavirus and what happened with this and that and the other and the stock market? Just give me the data and without too much bias as far as who's to blame. So I will watch that. And I have a I have a go to app I use for that. And then what she does, she never watches the news ever. It's just not her thing. She she prefers to read it. And so as far as learning new things, whether a person reads it. If you have a book that's really good, that's accurate, and it feels like and you're, and you're used to reading, that's a great way to go. Peter Lepukov, who I worked with at INE many years ago, like nine, ten years ago, uh, he is, I think he works at Facebook or Microsoft, one of the, you know, or a big company now, super smart guy. He has, he goes, when people would fail the CCA, he'd tell them, it's all right. You know, I had to take the CCA exam four times. <laughs> and then he says, after a pause, and I got four different CCAs. He has this thick Russian accent. He's just so great. Peter Lepukov, if you ever have a chance to meet him or read his work or, or, or shake his hand, well, maybe give him an elbow bump now with the virus going around, do it. He's a great guy. Uh, whenever we'd teach at CC at, uh, at INE, if he was in the area or in the room, I'd always pick his brain. And sometimes he'd joke with us. I think he was, I'm not sure. Next time I see him, I'll have to ask him. Sometimes he would tell us details about technology with like IP packets and he would describe something in the header or some part of the IP packet and I think to myself that doesn't that doesn't exist in the IP packet and and I thought to myself I know he knows 
right? He knows. But is he testing me? Should I just say, uh-huh? He's great. He's great. And he's super wicked smart. So he has four CCAs. But getting back to the point of the question, he would, uh, he read, that's how he studied for his CCAs is he went to the documentation. He looked at the blueprints. He looked at the technologies. He then labbed the heck out of all of them, but just studied. I don't think he watched a lot of any videos to get his CCAs. He just read, read, read. So it depends on how you learn. For me, what I love doing is I love a short, I, sh I love a short ramp up, like a learning curve. And so if I want to get into a new topic, for me, video just crushes it for getting in and getting started. And then once I have the, the, the basics, then I can say, okay, I got the basics. I have the framework. Now I can start using books and other research and labbing it up and getting more hands-on practice. So for me, it's video. For other people, if you're more adaptable to reading, that's your thing. But I do a lot of reading <laughs> because sometimes like RFCs, I used to not like RFCs like 20 years ago. RFCs, but if you want to find out why in DHCP, that broadcast bit is there and sometimes it's set and sometimes it's not set and when it happens and when it doesn't happen, the RFC is a wonderful resource. Just go read the RFC. And then you can take a look at based on how Cisco or Juniper or, or some other vendor implemented that technology based on the RFC. And sometimes the RFCs are created after the fact based on technologies that Cisco had, like uh, ISL, InterSwitch Link, a trunking mechanism, which Cisco had before 802.1Q existed. So it's great stuff. All right, moving down. Uh, will this content be available offline? So I think YouTube has the ability to download content, I believe. So uh, this will be stored on YouTube. It will make it part of the master playlist for CCNA 200-301. And I think, you can, I think YouTube has the ability f to download content locally and watch it later. I believe that's the thing. <laughs> I don't know if I've ever done it, but I believe it's a thing. All right. Let's see if there's any others. And I've got just a, yeah, I've got eight more minutes, plenty of time. Yes, Charles, thank you. Three ways of learning, visual, auditory, and kinesthetic. Absolutely. Seeing things, hearing things, or more of a touchy-feely experiencing things. And I think that all of them can be used to help reinforce the learning. One of the things I found to help really re reinforce learning is teaching it to others. Like, tell somebody else about the TCPIP protocol stack, a loved one, and just explain it or whatever the topic is you're learning. And I often discover when I do that the first time is that, wow, I've got a lot of holes in my theory and my logic. I need to revisit that. And then I revisit it and get better and better every time. Um, uh, Lafayette, in, in answer to your question, that's a little bit beyond what the CCNA is, so probably not in this channel. But we will be, we've covered access lists and we've other covered like port security and DHCP snooping and some other aspects. But we're going to focus primarily on the CCNA level. So beyond that, probably not a lot on this channel, just to set the expectation. All right. Shezzy says, Shezzy97, in case there was a different one. Hey, Shezzy. I hate programming. The way things are going, do you think it's possible to have a career in networking without learning all the automation stuff? All right. So you're in the same boat as I am. My son is an amazing programmer. Oh, my gosh. Just incredible. And he learned it. He loves it. That's where he wants to be. So the way it's going is that these Cisco devices like switches and routers and firewalls and so forth, they need configurations. And as we have more devices, we're going to be interacting with those devices more and more and more with APIs, which involves a controller chatting with that box, that router, that firewall, that switch, whatever that network device is, to give it instructions and to get instruction, get information from it. That language is APIs. So the API part, I want to I want to make sure that everybody who's on this channel is very comfortable that an API is nothing to be afraid of. It's simply, in fact, it's gonna, it's coming up soon. I'm not going to wait too long. We'll get out Postman and we'll take some public resource that everybody can do, and we'll bring up Postman and we'll talk about the basics of how this works. In fact, Star Wars. There's a Star Wars website that has an API that you can hit from Postman and you can pull the characters. So Maybe, maybe we'll start there. Um, but as far as understanding how that works is important. Do you have to write all the scripts and do you have to create the... You don't have to. But there's tools out there 
where you can use a tool like Postman and then you can click on the code button and you can get that code in like Python and all these other formats. So you don't actually have to create the code. You just have to be aware of how it works would be my recommendation and then where it applies and then what orchestration platform is used using is being used to manage the controllers which are actually managing the devices. So as far as becoming a programmer, I'm not going to do that. I will pass DevNet though. <laughs> I'm I'm learning a lot. I'm studying that right now. In fact, the best resource for DevNet when we were creating DevNet at CBT Nuggets, I thought, yeah, this is nice, DevNet. And uh, Ben Finkel did a lot of the infrastructure stuff, like how to use Visual Studio and so forth. And and then um, Knox came in and talked about using those tools and techniques to automate and to communicate with network devices using DevNet, Sandbox, and I think dCloud as well. And then I came back in the tail end of that, because it's based on the Blueprint, talking about how basic networking operates. Here's all these things you've been configuring, and here's what they do and how they work. I'm going through that now. I have never been so motivated. It's because I'm interested. And so I'm learning these basics, and I'm going through Ben's content right now. It's the first like 40% of the content, maybe 30%. And he's talking about object-oriented programming, the concepts, like what they are, frameworks like YAML, other, other things that I don't need to memorize and, and be experts in, but I do want to be in the back of my mind, know the concept of where that fits into the landscape. And so where my job is going to come in is that when I get to Knox's content, which I've, I've taken sneak, sneak peeks already, when he talks about setting up automation so we can use a, one interface and just talk to all these different devices, or we can talk to a controller with like DNA Center and get in, it's, it's amazing. And it's not fearful. So I'm never, I'm not going to be writing code as a network engineer or a network architect or a network support, person who supports networks. But I am going to be familiar with how that works. And I'm going to get my DevNet associate certification as a baseline mark that says, yes, Keith understands these basics. And that's what the CCNA is too, just so you know. The CCNA says, I have this basic knowledge of how this works, how these pieces fit together. I'm not an expert, but I have a basic understanding of a lot of these parts. And then... You take that information and then you move it forward. That's the secret. Take the information and move it forward. Apply it. You're going to forget some of it. That's okay. You're going to get really, really good at some aspects. That's great too. And just keep on moving your career forward. The secret is just don't stop moving. My dad's 90. I talked to him today and he's, you know, he's two years ago he was using a Windows 7 computer. Now he's on an Apple. He has a smartphone. He has a, a smartwatch. And he swims an hour a day. I'm like, I, I, I. <laughs> How does a 90-year-old man swim an hour a day? Well, you start with one minute, and you go to two minutes and three minutes, and he has his watch, which is waterproof, and lets him swim. You know, my dad's a good example. We don't see eye to eye in politics. We don't. But um, he's got a really good attitude about always doing a little bit more, and his life uh, is representative of that. So ours too, right? No matter where you are, bottom of the ladder, middle of the ladder, you're on the ladder on the wrong building, move the ladder, start at the bottom. It's just a matter of keep on going. And, and when you have depressing days, I've got depression in my family, in my, in my family and some of my children's history. And, uh, you know, I'm a lucky guy. And I realize that some days are really, really crappy, just like the worst. Like I can't, I don't want to get out of bed. Uh, <laughs> if that sounds like it's coming out of me, it is. Sometimes I don't, sometimes I don't. And then I realize, okay, that's like, a, I'm going to treat that day like, uh, a sundial. A sundial is where it has a little angle thing and the sun shines on it. You can tell what time it is based on the shadow. Sundials don't work on cloudy days. So I take those cloudy days that weren't very good and I just say, you know what? To heck with it. I might use another word there. That's that day. My next day is this. Here's my goals for this day. Get out of bed. Exercise for 15 minutes. I don't feel like exercising. Yeah, but you'll feel better once you do. And then just go for small, repeatable patterns and then just keep going. Like today, I am sick. Not with, not with uh, coronavirus. I tried, like, what are the symptoms? I don't have those symptoms. I've got a sore throat and I don't feel very good. Uh, and that happens sometimes when you get germs. That's, that's how life is sometimes. But I thought to myself, I got a live stream. I got 221 people right now in the room that could probably benefit by being together, by me facilitating a discussion. I should really do this. And so I thought... Yeah, heck yeah, I'm going to do this. So sometimes moving helps 
There's also, oh, we're talking about depression now. There's also a podcast called The Hilarious World of Depression. There is nothing hilarious about depression. And this podcast focuses on the fact that it's real and it has celebrities who suffer from depression and how they're pulling through and their techniques. It also helps to have a community. So whatever. So this community is not about depression. It's like, hey, I'm joining Keith Barker Networking. We get two things. One, we get CCNA, you know, like instructor hours with the trainer. And two, we get to talk about depression. <laughs> There's specialists for those things. And I just realized that life is hard sometimes, a lot of times. So keep on going. Everybody within the sound of my voice, whether you're live or recorded later, uh, it's, if it's really terrible for you right now, it's going to change. It may go better or worse but you're not going to be stuck right here if you just continue to move. All right. All right. Root beer saying uh, iOS 12.2 is domain dash lookup. And I think the newer versions like 15 is domain space lookup, but I will verify that later unless somebody else does. All right. Um, let me take a couple more. Oh, da Drusher's asking, oh, your studio is like Batcave and you're Batman. Thanks for these great streams. <laughs> uh, thanks. It took me a long, if you go, if you want a good laugh sometime, and sometimes it's fun to have a laugh, look for any videos I did on YouTube that I started like in 2009. Look for any video that's more than a year old. And this office, if I'm, if I'm doing video in this office, it's all white, like wash white. And I'm, Oh my gosh, they're painful for me to watch, but they remind me of the journey that we are all on. Let's make it a little bit better, a little bit better, a little bit better, and give everybody a big margin. Be kind to everybody. You don't know who you're going to work for in the future or be forced to be kind in the future. It pays to be nice to everybody. Okay, Dan saying iOS gear 15X on 2811. No IP domain. Oh, domain dash dash lookup. Okay, so domain dash lookup must be the current flavor. Thank you, Dan, for doing that. Save me time. So you can put in either command, and the domain dash lookup is the winner. The one the actual router takes. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, I think that's it for all the Q and A. I have had a lot of fun. Thanks for getting me out of bed today, so that I could uh, prepare for this and have some fun and sharing with you how you can do hands-on practice with a controller and put a full topology together with zero dollars. All you need is a computer. You don't need to have a big computer because Packet Tracer, they have a version for Linux. They've got a, um, I think they have a version for Linux, Mac, and Windows, if I'm not mistaken, and a mobile platform. So whatever you're on, actually the mobile, stay away from <laughs> The mobile's tricky, especially on a small mobile device. It's like, boink, 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 and then the command line is not very doable. But um, it's very affordable to do, so I would encourage you to do that if you want to practice or lab something up. We've had great experience today from Dan and others. When I had that question about, is it domain space lookup or domain dash lookup? Lab it up. Find out what the results are, and I appreciate the feedback that it's domain dash lookup. Join us in Discord. If you need a link to that, I will. it's in the description of this video after it's posted as well, so you can actually just click on that. Um, I think that's it. Uh, I've already asked you to subscribe if you enjoyed the content and want more alerts. Our next stream is on Saturday, Subnet Saturday. Holy schnikers, we get to cover, I think we're going to do um, summarization. Yeah, it's time for summarization, where we can summarize a range of addresses with one single route and simplify our routing tables based on summarization. So it's like taking a normal mask and then reducing it. So it's the opposite of, of subnetting. It's also called supernetting or summarization. All right. Thank you, everybody. I'm off to see my cat. Uh, I'll let you know on Saturday how it went. If you're interested, I can also possibly bring a picture. And uh, everybody have a great, great rest of the week. And for the 217 people that are on live right now, I really appreciate your time. And for everybody else who's watching this after the fact, I wish you the absolute best as well. Let's be in the next live stream or the next video together. And together we can conquer anything. Bye, everybody. <laughs>